So 2022 is gone and we're now already dipping our toes into what's coming this year. Now the Media 13 Awards that have taken place over this month have acted as a sort of send off for content that was released last year, but I figured that today we talk about some of my favourites and two that I haven't had a chance to cover yet. Before I get into it I want to clarify a few things. I'm not covering Wednesday here, if all goes well that's going to get its own video pretty soon on the channel, just stay tuned to find out more on that. And also if you couldn't tell by the thumbnail, the two films that I've included that I have not had a chance to really talk about yet are Glass Onion and Knives Out Story and Avatar The Way of Water. I'm not doing Werewolf by Night this time around because as much as I love it and as much as I would like to talk about it, I know you have already probably got sick of me ranting about it. But without any more hesitation, let's just get into it. First things first, this is a film that I've talked about previously on the channel back when it first released last March. So if you're interested in seeing that, you should go and check that video, it's going to have my longer thoughts on the film. If it wasn't blatantly obvious, I love the Batman. I love its gothic appeal, I love the performances, I love the setting, everything about it is just amazing. From Greg Fraser's cinematography to Michael Giacchino's score, everything works to service other little things within the movie. The score elevates Gotham from a tonal perspective, the set design is what brings Gotham to life, but it's the cinematography and the way that the city is shot that takes the cake. However, all of these products work in tandem with each other to create a one cohesive vision of a rundown city up to its knees in corruption, and it's just phenomenal. I don't need to go over this that much because if you followed the award, you know that this movie won for both score and cinematography, so that should be a pretty good indicator towards my thoughts on it in general. Another Media 13 award winning aspect that this film had was the performances with Robert Pattinson taking home lead performance and Paul Dano taking home supporting performance. Both of these guys are complete powerhouses and it's both the performances here that create much of the leverage with this film's emotional baggage. I had previously only seen Paul Dano's work in Prisoners so I didn't have much of a pre-decided opinion on him going into this movie for the first time, but I distinctly remember coming out of this first showing thinking, this dude killed it. The creepiness, the scare factor, the way he's able to carry himself as this intimidating animal because he portrays the opposite characteristics is just amazing. Dino absolutely blows this role out of the water and his Riddler is easily one of my favourite comic book movie villains. For sure my favourite DC one. Robert Pattinson is just yet another one of the amazing standout points of this movie. Honestly my favourite Batman, I will admit that. He plays both sides of the coin so well, he goes between this rough spoken hard-going vigilante and this reclusive billionaire that looks as if he has never socialised in the last 12 years. The subtlety of his work in this role is utilised to a T and I think it is perfect. These guys along with Zoe Kravitz, John Turturro, Colin Farrell and Andy Serkis create this genuinely stacked cast that has no weak point in sight. I don't think there's a single place where this movie goes wrong, it establishes a brand new Batman trilogy and it does it in style. Even able to slow things down long enough to throw in a tease towards the Joker of this universe, which is fucking terrifying by the way and I still don't know how I feel about it. I said it once last year, and I will say it again now. There is nothing quite like the Batman. Easily one of my favourite comic book movies, and that is a sentiment shared among many of those that have seen it. It's the first time we've seen a live action Batman take on more of the detective side of the character. This is a crime thriller before it's a superhero bash and I have nothing but respect and love for everyone involved, most of all Matt Reeves, for crafting this story in such a gorgeous way. But he is not known for comic book movies, he is a filmmaker that has come in with genuine credibility to his name outside of the genre and put his stamp on it with force. This movie is the sole reason looking back that I have any hope whatsoever for the DC slate and I'm probably not alone in thinking that. But you know, this film features someone that is known to most comic readers as the world's greatest detective. My question is, is there anyone that can match it? Glass Onion, A Knives Out Mystery, A Benoit Blanc Story, A Ryan Johnson Film is great. Glass Onion is just a really good, solid movie. 
Ryan Johnson returns with yet another banger, as if Knives Out and The Last Jedi were not proof enough already that he was a great director. In this instalment of the series, Daniel Craig returns as Benoit Blanc, only this time amped up to 11. In terms of tone, this one's upped yet again in the silliness rating. The movie does have a tendency to let itself slip into absurdity in the dialogue, yet I think it does it in a totally deserved way. And don't get me wrong, I prefer Knives Out, although that's not to say that this movie doesn't have things that I would consider superior over Knives Out. For instance, the cast. I think this thing is stacked and narrowly edges Knives Out. The film structures itself very differently to Knives Out, however, because one half of this film is a complete misdirect, and I fucking love it for that. Around halfway through the movie, there's this big moment, and then it goes back to the start of the movie to show us a truth that we hadn't been made aware of, then going through it once more to show us how the truth affects things, and honestly, as a way of subverting what I and many other people expected this to be, definitely wasn't a bad way to do it. The writing is clever as hell. I think yet again, Ryan Johnson has proved that regardless of controversy, he is able to craft a great story with really well-written characters. His quality is just so consistent across the board and I don't think he drops the ball here. I think it's clear to me that everyone is on board with the vision that he has for this movie from minute one and they're all having a blast making this vision a reality. None more so than Daniel Craig, of course, who I just... I, I just love him. Edward Norton's actually a lot of fun in this. Now, I don't know if I'm the only one that thought that he was going to be the movie's victim and then it was obviously going to revolve around trying to solve him, but that's what I thought. So I was pleasantly surprised when I ended up seeing that he survived and was, in fact, spoiler alert, the killer. But it's just a great misdirect that I didn't see coming at all because, you know, I thought Dave Bautista was going to be a character that made it right to the end, especially when he was one of the guests that was featured more prominently on screen at the early parts of the movie. Glass Onion's strongest feature is its writing and the way it folds in on itself while keeping itself neat and concise. It leaves literally zero space for wiggle room in terms of plot holes and this thing is just... You know, it's so good I could scream. Speaking of... <laughs> Now it should come as no surprise that as someone who holds this franchise very closely, having the first film as literally their favourite movie of all time, I had expectations for this thing. I distinctly remember giving it a 7 out of 10 the first time I saw it, and it was 4th on my ranking of the films. And to think that it's now firmly rooted at 2nd, rivaled only by Scream 4? I'd like to call that character development. I love this movie. I'm still a little annoyed I didn't get around to giving it its own video, and I'm certainly not writing that off sometime in the future, but this thing really is great. Now I will admit, the lead role sort of puzzles me. I have no doubt that Melissa Barrera is a fantastic actress, um, I just don't know if she's a horror actress based on what I've seen here. You could look at it from the point of view that her character is obviously on a lot of medication, so she's maybe not processing things correctly, um, which is maybe accounted for all the sort of lacklustre reactions to certain things. But even besides that, this character is quickly overshadowed by pretty much everyone in the film, and I think that's dangerous when you're supposed to be trying to lead the movie. It's also bad when you then look back at what made the first four movies, like Nev Campbell made that shit her own. I just don't see that from Melissa in this. I mean, I, I have hope that she can improve for the sequel and I have no doubt that she probably will. But with all the characters outshining her currently and Kirby returning from the fourth film, it's looking like she's going to have a bit of a long way to go. I love how faithful this feels to Wes in the legacy of his Scream movies. This one continues on that trend of essentially ripping into whatever trending topic currently has its firm grip on film. It's very much a staple of the Scream movies and it's definitely present here and it works 100%. The inclusion of Billy as Sam's father is a weird one that I wasn't totally on board with at the time but I've since come around on. I'm still not completely certain I'm aware of how it makes sense but at the same time I think I am. The killer reveal is often the high point of a Scream movie and a lot of people have criticised this one for being pretty predictable, and to an extent, I can I can see that. I can understand why you'd think this reveal was predictable. I also kind of think, in a weird way, that's almost the point. I mean, if this is a horror requel, doesn't it make sense that it retreads some ground from the thing that started it all? I mean, the entire third act is centred around Stu Marker's house once again, and once again, I love it, by the way. Genuinely one of my favourite locations in all of film. Legacy characters are also fun. I, I think there should be a bit more between Dewey and Gale because there seems to be a lot of unexplored ground between the two of them. 
but at least we get Dewey at his best for that time that we do have him. That entire sequence is fantastic by the way, an absolutely amazing segment that I'm ashamed to say I saw coming because I remembered how The Force Awakens killed Han Solo and I thought, hey, wouldn't it be funny if that happened to Dewey here, then Gale in the sequel and then Nev in the next one? And now looking back at my prediction being correct for the first part of that, I am incredibly scared. The kills in this movie too, brutal. I know it's got advantages because of the technology they have to utilise, but I think these kills do a really great job of sticking with you, especially Dewey's. I think it's also shot incredibly well, it's able to capture Ghostface as this very intimidating figure that the other films just haven't really done until now. In the previous four movies he's always had a bit of a campy vibe to his presence, but there's actually very little of that in this movie. I cannot wait to see what the sequel ends up bringing, you know, I'm so excited for it, it's going to have the likes of Samara Weaving, Jack Champion, Wait a minute, wasn't he in- Avatar The Way of Water is a very good movie that I have no desire to ever watch again, mainly because I don't think it has an ounce of rewatch value. It's no secret that I do not like the first movie, purely for the lack of a well written plot and any character that feels anything better than shallow. The Way of Water, I'm delighted to say, fixes one of these things. It's just so weird because every bit of praise that I want to give this movie is also tagged on with a flaw that affects the praise itself, but yet the flaw that comes with the praise doesn't change the fact that I still think it's a good movie, at least for now. I want to praise the 75% of the movie's visual effects that aren't waiting for me to pick up a PlayStation remote. The score was fantastic, but if you asked me to name a specific track, I couldn't. There's nothing incredibly memorable that stands out. Changes between frame rate are just weird and very jarring at times. The story is as cookie cutter as action movies come, and by that logic it's not bad but it's also not anything special, and for Avatar, a movie that has been highly praised as something special, that makes me feel let down. The film is clunky and generic as hell but that's kind of okay because all the film really wants to do is look good, and in fairness it does when it doesn't look like it's straight out of a video game cutscene. The characters, sure they're good and feel well written, but until I dare to go back to this thing, I'm not going to know if that's purely down to how unbelievably below average they were in the first film. Like this is the better movie, but is it a great one? I really do not know. My rating says that I thought it was great, but come on, we all know I can't be trusted with these sometimes. Pacing wise, this movie makes you feel the runtime. Now this is going to be the most divisive point I make, arguably. Because you get different views on this depending on who you ask, but I don't know man, this movie feels at least 30 minutes too long and even then I'd probably still be, still be bored. However, if I am to give any sort of undeniable, untake backable praise for this movie, it would have to be the villain. Because my god is it so so refreshing to finally have a villain that has no chance of redemption and just wants to be a complete dickhead. I also want to defend the movie a little bit because I've seen really garbage takes that the movie is bad because it spoon feeds you 13 years of information in the opening scene and it's just sort of like, you know, what's your point? Yeah, this thing gives you exposition. Would you rather have another film in between this that takes another 10 years? But regardless of that, I hope you did enjoy my opinion on Avatar 2 because by the time James Cameron finds this, I'll probably be dead in the ditch. Just wait until he finds out that I only watched it in 2D. Honestly speaking, I don't think this would have won anything at the Media 13 Awards. Now, it definitely would have been in the running for something like Best Visual Effects, um, Best Score 2, but I don't think it wins either of those. I think it's a perfectly fine film, and my best attempt to summarise this film is probably how I opened this segment. It's a good film that I don't want to watch again. Now I don't have a clue how I was supposed to transition from Avatar to Top Gun Maverick, so we're not we're not having a fun transition here. I apologize. Top Gun Maverick is one of the greatest films I have ever seen, straight up. I cannot begin to describe to you how good this thing actually is. I am gonna try because I need to do at least a minute and a half here. It's just a complete masterpiece from beginning to end. The acting is fantastic. The cinematography, the visual effects, the score—it's all just oh, it's so good. Joseph Kaczynski deserves the absolute world for bringing this thing to life. It is a complete work of art. 
What's more, this film is probably going to go down as what is my favourite cinema experience to date because of how it made me feel come the ending. You know, I shed real tears at this and not because of some heart tug moment that was only there to be sad. The resolution at the movie's end is so emotionally powerful and built so well throughout the movie that it all just rises and releases in one big moment of elation. As the movie's main soundtrack song blasts over the visual ending credits, I was in awe. You know, in that moment I truly believed that I'd just seen one of the greatest films I could ever possibly see and I'd been able to see it in the cinema. You know, like I mentioned it in the video that I released last May when I first watched this thing, but leaving that cinema, there was only one thing on my mind and it was the absolute certainty that I had just witnessed cinema in its purest form. You know, I can't profess to be a loyal follower of Tom Cruise and his career. Um, only recently have I actually started to delve into it and find out more about him. This is probably his best performance for me. You know, he perfectly balances the weight of everything his character should be carrying. There's not a single performance in this movie that is underwhelming, not one where it feels phoned in. Everybody knows what they're doing and how it has to be done and they do it better. I love the underlying theme of family and forgiveness that this movie has too. Not so much forgiveness in others, but also in self-forgiveness. We can see that a big reason behind Maverick's resilience towards Rooster is because of his own guilt for the events of the previous movie. A recurring idea in this movie is to push your limits and I feel like that is almost representative of what this movie does in itself. It is a masterclass in both storytelling and filmmaking and this might sound as pretentious as hell, trust me I know, but I feel blessed to have seen this on the big screen the way films are meant to be seen. And so with that out of the way, that's going to do it for the award season this year. Hooray! We're finally done! If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like because I do appreciate it. You can also subscribe so you don't miss out on next month's video, which I am not allowed to disclose yet. A big thank you to everyone on the screen right now. Uh, I appreciate every one of you, whether it's just helping me get footage for stuff or, you know, previewing content before it goes out to make sure it's good. I really genuinely appreciate all of it. Thank you. But yes, there will be a video next month. I cannot tell you what it is right now. Um, so with that out of the way, I have been Jordan. And I will see you next Wednesday for everybody's favourite Letterboxd Logged Show.